All right, guys, welcome back to the project. So in this one, we're going to be building a fairly complex, uh, just kind of generic cabinet. So these cabinets are very popular in the woodworking and the fine woodworking world because they let you just get good practice with joinery and just let you have a lot of fun with a lot of the different aspects of fine woodworking. And so I started this project because I recently started a new part-time job that was taking up a decent amount of my time. And as well, I was adjusting to that job. I wanted somewhat of a simple project to work on. Uh, I do have a couple of the projects on the go, but those are all fairly complex things that I didn't think I would have, you know, the mental stamina for uh, while I was adjusting to this new job. But the thing that happened with this project is as the ideas started rolling, you know, as I went from the design phase to the actual starting construction of it, I kept figuring out new and interesting ways and things I could do to just make this cabinet so much more beautiful. So as you can see here, I'm milling down this eight quarter piece of white oak. Now I've been saving this piece of eight quarter white oak specifically because it has a whole bunch of beautiful figure to it. And so the figure in it is just something that I've never really seen in white oak. The grain is super curly and just kind of generally beautiful. And so I didn't know what to do with it. I bought it initially to use as leg stock and I think the desk project if I remember correctly. But I decided that I would look really weird using this really curly grain for straight post leg. So I set this piece aside and tried to figure out a good project for it and this seemed like the perfect project. And so one of the reasons that this project came together is because I had a piece of white oak with this really beautiful crotch figure to it. And so I wanted to make a small cabinet with a nice book matched door panel. And so as I started working on this and as I tried to dig through my lumber pile to find stock for making the actual cabinet itself, that's when I remembered that I had this beautiful piece of eight quarter white oak. And so I figured, well, if I'm gonna make a nice book match front door panel, then I might as well book match the side panels and use all this beautiful eight quarter, curly eight quarter stock for the rest of the cabinet. So as you can see here, I went through, resawed all the sides down and was left with these beautiful wide book match panels that will then make up the sides of my cabinet here. And so this isn't really something that is really obvious when you look at the cabinet in its finished form. It's a very, very subtle touch, but that's why what I really like about this cabinet and where I've had it, where I have hung it up in its final place, is that I get to see both sides of it. And when you see it from the outside, you really get to see this beautiful book match of these outer two panels. Because both sides, no matter which side you look at this cabinet from, look the exact same, which is a really, really interesting thing that I've never really thought about before. And it's a super subtle detail, but it's something that, again, is just so much more interesting and just such a cool thing that I could do. And so with that theme set in place, this project went from something that was supposed to be fairly simple and just something to take my mind off my new job to something where I was absolutely torturing my bandsaw. So my bandsaw is a decent bandsaw. It's a uh, one and three quarter horsepower Rikon. So it does have the ability to resaw, but when you're talking about these nine inch wide solid white oak panels, that was a little bit much for it. So luckily I didn't really have any major issues. I made sure to use nice, fresh, brand new blades anytime I was doing the resawing, but everything, basically everything on this project came from resawed eight quarter white oak. And so with all my case pieces milled and right to their final thickness, I could start working on the joinery. Now again, very common with these small fine woodworking cabinets is dovetail joinery for the case joinery. And so I genuinely love dovetail joinery. There's something about it that just looks super cool whether you do it perfectly or there's a few errors here and there. Uh, it doesn't matter, it always comes out looking really good. And so a technique that I've been trying to work on with my dovetails is adding in this rabbit all along the back. And so you have a couple different options when you want to add a rabbet to the back of a case like this. Uh, one option that most people take is you can cut your dovetails just like normal, and then you can go back in with a rabbiting bit on a router and just cut your rabbet that way. That's quite a bit easier and a little bit more foolproof, uh, whereas the way I'm doing it here is I'm preemptively cutting that rabbet, and then when I cut my dovetails, I have to very specifically size them to fit around that rabbet. So the reason I'm doing it this way is purely because it's a little bit more complex. Uh, it also has the benefit of it it's a, ends up with a little bit of a cleaner rabbit. I've never had good luck with rabbiting bits in a router table. So I like to try and avoid that wherever I can. And I pre much prefer to use my table saw for stuff like this because it, it does leave a much nicer finish. And so the only real trick with this is that when you're setting up your dovetails, you just have to either add the space for that rabbit or you can figure it, you know, it really just takes some time and patience and practice to figure out how to lay out your dovetails. 
The other thing that I did differently on this project that I haven't done in a little while is use this 14 degree dovetail jig. Now, I put out a video recently about what my opinions are on these dovetail jigs, and honestly, I'm kind of torn. Because in a case like this, you know, no pun intended, uh, it does do a much better job of giving you very accurate, very nicely laid out dovetails. As you can see here, my cuts are pretty much perfectly at the 14 degree mark. That's also important to mention here is that these are 14 degree dovetails, so these are a lot steeper than what I've been doing in a lot of my past projects, which are generally 1 to 8 ratio dovetails. So this 14 degree dovetail is quite a bit steeper, uh, and a lot more dramatic, which in some cases, like this, I do like. I do like that 14 degree angle because it is very, it's a very dramatic dovetail, and it really doesn't affect the strength or you know, overall structure of the dovetail itself. So with this jig, I did find that it did give a much nicer result than I've gotten in the past, and all of my dovetails were very uniform in their angle, which is a really nice thing. So in a project like this, where my joinery is going to be very visible, I actually really appreciated having that dovetail jig. Because even though I do have a decent amount of practice cutting dovetails, I'm not anywhere near a professional yet. I still have, there's all, generally always going to be a time where I'll screw up at least one dovetail on a side or something. And so just having the jig takes away some of that error and some of that, you know, some of the problems that can come in when you're hand cutting, you know, sometimes your angle is going to change and, you know, just minor things like that. So the jig does come in handy when you want perfectly matching dovetails all the way along. So that's not to say that one way is better than the other. It really just depends on, you know, what you're trying to do and what your personality is. And so to transfer the dovetails or to transfer the tails over to the pin board, I really like this method that I believe it was Mike Pekovich came up with where you just put a little bit of green tape over the end grain and this makes it a lot easier to mark out and just visually see where your dovetails are landing. Now again, I'll sometimes I'll use this trick, sometimes I won't, it'll all depend on specifically what kind of wood I'm working with. Especially with a wood like white oak, that's very hard. When you try to cut a knife line into the end grain, it takes quite a bit more effort than again, something like walnut or cherry. So this is where the green tape trick comes in really handy because it makes it very obvious where you're trying to cut. You don't have to worry about missing out on your line or cutting in the wrong spot because you weren't able to get your knife line deep enough. And so again, I'm using the jig to make sure I get my angles perfectly matching that 14 degree angle from the tails we just cut. The other nice thing about using these jigs is that they, the one, the Veritas ones that I have comes with a 90 degree jig. So I can use it to cut right around these pins that are going to make the, the rabbits line up and I can make sure that it is, is at as straight of a cut as I possibly can get, which is really important if you want to be able to hide those rabbits properly. And so one of the things that is very annoying about dovetails is clearing out the waste on the pin board. Uh, you know, generally speaking, one of the things that I found with cutting dovetails is that when you start cutting dovetails, when you're working on the actual tails portion, it's very fast, it's a lot of fun, you do it a little bit of chisel work, a little bit of sawing work, it's just a generally fun and enjoyable thing to do. Whereas when you jump over to doing the pin board, this is where dovetails start to become less enjoyable because you've got a lot of material to cut out, there's a lot of stuff you have to remove, and this is again where a trick I learned from Mike Pekovich comes in super handy, and that is using a really short flush trim bit in a palm router. So this is something that is just, to me, is the best thing I've ever found online to make dovetails more enjoyable. Because what this does is two things. It gives you an absolutely perfect flat bottom or flat baseline to line everything up to. You know everything is going to be just about perfect. It also helps to square up some of your pins because quite often when you're hand cutting, if you're just hand cutting your pins, or even if you're using a jig like I did, you'll no you may have noticed that some of my pins flared out at the bottom. And so when you take that flush trim bit and line it up against and run it up against the top of the pins there, it helps to make sure that all of your pins are perfectly straight up and down uh, compared to whatever your reference surface is. So it do you do have to make sure that you set it up perfectly but it does, it does make the process a lot more enjoyable because you're not having to remove all that material with a chisel. And so moving on from the case itself, we're gonna start working on the internal components. So again, I'm going back to resawing some of this eight quarter stock for basically one reason here, and that is I wanted nice, wide, solid pieces. I didn't want to try and do any panel glue ups for this project because such an important part of it was keeping these panels as wide as possible. So again, going back to that same piece that I took the rest of the, the case structure from, uh, I was went back and resawed down uh, the bottom divider, which is going to separate our main compartment from our drawers, 
as well as the two shelves that are the two floating shelves that are going to go on the inside. And so we're also going to cut down a little bit of walnut here, which you guys are going to see what I do with that with these shelves in just a little bit here. But again, you think the important thing to remember here is that when you're working on a project like this, you kind of have two different options. You can make all of these wide pieces out of simple panels. You know, you could resaw some eight quarter stock down into strips and make a nice straight grain panel, or you can work with nice wide pieces. And so one of the challenges with working with wide pieces like this is for one, finding wide pieces. Most lumber yards, it's very challenging to find pieces that are this wide. Uh, if I remember correctly, all these pieces started out at you know, just, a, just over nine and a half inches wide, which is again, something that is somewhat difficult to find nowadays with the way that lumber works. And so for this bottom divider, I wanted to go with Morrison Pen and Joinery because it just looks cool. Uh, I haven't had an option to do a lot of through mortise and tenon joinery, so I figured that this was a good place to practice. And again, going back to using that 90 degree dovetail jig, this helped me cut my, my tenons nice and square and straight to the stock. And so there's a whole bunch of different ways you could go about cutting these tenons. Uh, you could use the band saw, there's ways you could do it on the table saw, but I've decided to just go with what do and do it by hand because, well, it's just kind of more fun that way. And again, I already had everything out to cut my dovetails and this really is not that much different. And so again, you can see I'm leaving my baseline quite messy and I'm gonna be using the router with that short flush trim bit to make sure that I clean up and get a nice perfectly square baseline. Now, one of the things you do have to watch out for when you're using the router to get your baselines on whether it's dovetails or tenons like this is that you don't screw up. So what ended up happening when I was working on this project is when I went to cut the baseline for my tenons on my first piece, uh, I just grabbed my palm router. I assumed that I had the depth still set the same as when I cut my dovetails, the baselines on my dovetails, and I just went for it. And I found out very quickly that I was sadly mistaken, that my depth was way off. So I ended up, luckily enough, I had enough material left over on my shelf pieces, on my floating shelf pieces, that I could then mill down one of those to be the same, the thickness that I needed to match into my area here. So I got very lucky that I had enough material left over, but yes, you gotta be very careful when you're using the router to cut to your baseline, because if you go too far, there's no bringing that material back. So you're much better to take it nice and slow, sneak up on that cut as best as you can. And so for the mortises on the outside, again, these are gonna be through mortises because I wanna be able to see that little bit of end grain detail on the outside. So the best way to go about doing this is to start with as large of a drill bit as you can get in there. So for me, I could get a 3 8 brad point bit right nicely centered in these mortises, and that gave me a nice clear out area to then push material into. And so like I always, you always wanna start from your outside or your most visible face and make sure that you're clearing to your line there as best you can. Then you want, when you're fitting up these tenons, the trick here is that on the inside of this case, no one's ever gonna see the joinery. It's gonna get completely covered up because we do have a little bit of a shoulder around the tenons. So the best way to do this is to start by making sure that your outside, that, that the tenons fit into the outside. So as you saw there, I'm just making sure that these fit perfectly into that outside face. And you have to make sure that you're lining your tenons up properly. You don't wanna make sure that, you wanna make sure that your panel's not flipped around, anything weird like that. And the reason that this works so well is that when you then drive your divider piece in from the in, from the inside where it's going to go in when you actually do the glue up, is you know that the outside of your tenons is going to be perfectly lined up with the mortises you just cut on the outside of the invisible faces. So if your tenons taper a little bit narrower on the inside, it's not going to be a big deal. And if your mortises are a little bit flared out on the inside, again, it's not going to affect the overall visual appearance of your piece. And so with the bottom divider in, I can then go in and add the drawer divider. So because I don't want to just put one large drawer on the bottom of this thing, I decided to just put in a nice simple dado on our middle divider and our bottom case piece that will then hold the divider to keep our drawers a little bit separated. And so the most important thing here was properly aligning the markings for where I need to cut the data. Because once you take this piece apart, there's no way to align things to the same point that they need to be when it's fully assembled. So by making sure that you have proper markings, it makes cutting the data a lot easier. The other thing you need to make very sure of before you actually cut your data, which I did not do a good job of, is that your data is set to the size that you actually want. So some dado stacks like the one I have are designed specifically for undersized plywood. So when your dado stack booklet says it's gonna be half an inch, it's actually gonna be just slightly under half an inch, which is a really terrible design choice by the manufacturers. I don't quite understand why they do this, but it is something that you have to know and understand and work with. 
And so with everything in place, I could then go and start cleaning things up. So before I glue in that bottom divider, before I try and fit anything up, I wanted this case to be in its final structural form. So I went through, sanded everything on the inside up to 220 grit to make sure it's nice and smooth and finished. And again, you always want to try and pre-finish the inside of these cases. It's a lot easier to clean up glue squeeze out in that when you have finish on the inside. Uh, again, this is just my personal experience, but it's also a lot easier to finish the inside of, this, of cases like this when they're in separate pieces like this. So it's really important to go and put some green tape or something over your dovetails, over your joinery, so that the glue doesn't isn't affected when you actually go to do your glue up. And then you want to do a nice good coat of oil on the inside of your case here. And so the interesting thing about this glue up is that it wasn't nearly as stressful as some of the other ones I've done in the past. Uh, there are two reasons for this. First off is because I've really gotten used to using Type On 3, which has a pretty good amount of working time. That 10 minutes of open working time I find is plenty for most of the work I'm going to do. Now I don't want this to sound like an ad, but definitely if you're doing fine woodworking, you're doing complex glue ups like I'm doing here, uh, using something like Type On 3 is going to make your life a little easier. There are other glues out there that you can get extended working times, but yeah, definitely the more working open time you can have with the glue, the better it's going to be. The other thing that made this pretty simple is because I took a lot of time to make sure that my joinery was as clean as I possibly could get it. As you can see here, I did have to throw on some clamps to really compress the uh, case around those tenons, and that was purely because the glue had started to tear up at that point and was getting a little bit stiffer, so I wasn't able to hammer it together as nicely. And so for this project, I decided to go through and flush up all of my tenons and my dovetails. So that really, again, this is a thing that comes down to personal preference. On some projects in the past, like the tea cabinet I built a while back, I left my dovetails slightly proud. This is just kind of an interesting visual look and has a little bit of more depth to it. Whereas on this project, I really wanted everything perfectly flushed up and clean looking. So I went through with my hand plane, cleaned up all of the protruding dovetail areas, and just was left with a beautiful, flush, glossy finish that you can get from white oak when you use a hand plane. And so again, one of the things you'll notice consistently throughout this project is that as soon as I finish a section of it, I will apply finish. And this is something you can only really do when using a traditional finish like this tread and true oil that I'm using here. Because when you use a traditional finish, it's not affected by really anything. You don't really have to worry about scratching it. You don't have to worry about dust getting built up on it. Because all you do if you get a little bit of dust on it is just wipe it off with a little bit of that finish on a rag. It makes it super easy to just continually work around this piece and make things just a lot easier. So the next step here was to start installing the door. Now, one of the things that I've never tried before is, put, is building an offset into my door and then mounting that onto the case. So what I really liked about this is that I wasn't trying to cut my hinges, my hinge mortises directly into my case itself. So I was very worried about screwing up these hinge mortises and then and that ended up ruining the whole project in and of itself. So by using this spacer piece, I was able to nicely cut my mortises into this piece and luckily I was able to do it first try on this piece, which was kind of a shock to me but it came out really nicely. And so what this space will allow me to do is have the door open fully. If you just put your hinges directly onto your case, sometimes they can be limited by the case itself. And so you won't be able to open that door the full 180 degrees that you, know, that you sometimes want from a door like this. And so the spacer piece makes it super easy to cut your hinge mortises because it's all outside of the case. And then all I had to do is go in and add a couple screws along the length of it because you have to remember that the screws from the hinges are also going to go directly into the case itself, but I also added, I think, four screws to the whole length of this spacer piece just to make sure that it was held firmly in place. The next part was actually starting on the door. So here you can see that piece of white oak I was talking about with this beautiful section of crotch figure. Now, one of the downsides to where I live here in Alberta is that we don't have a lot of access to highly figured woods because most of the, you know, the, most of the woods that I like to work with, uh, white oak, walnut, cherry, all that stuff, it just doesn't grow around here naturally. So by the time that these big companies, that mill lumber and that ship it out to this area, we don't get a lot of access to this beautiful figure wood. So when I found, when I got this piece out of lumber yard, I just had to save it for a perfect project. And this seemed like the best thing I could do. 
I also have a piece very similar looking to this in Walnut that has a nice, you know, very similar looking bit of crotch figure to it that I'm going to be doing another project with at some point in the future and I've got that one saved. But for this one, I wanted to stick with White Oak because I like the overall White Oak combination on this project. And so at this point, I should mention that a big reason that I wanted to work with all this bookmatch stuff is because of the machinery that I've been able to purchase lately. Uh, the DeWalt planer that I just upgraded to did an amazing job of not causing a ton of tear out during the planing process. And the drum sander made sure that I could clean up and only take off a very small amount of material on this bookmatch panel, which again, leaves a very good finish and keeps it nice and flat. And so for the door, I wanted the actual structure and frame of the door to be as simple looking as possible. So one of the things that I made sure to do when I was cutting out my stock was I tried to get mostly rift sawn white oak. Now, if you don't know the difference between rift sawn and quarter sawn white oak, all this means is that in quarter sawn white oak, the grain is going directly through or straight through the piece in a kind of a vertical fashion. Whereas with rift sawn, it's going diagonally through. So what happens in white oak is when you quarter saw on white oak, you get a lot of large reflex, which can be quite distracting, and that's not what I wanted for this door. So by trying to get mainly rifts on white oak, I was able to get this nice straight green white oak that is really beautiful looking, but also doesn't take away from the, you know, the really interesting book match panel that I've got in there. And so for this door, I decided to go with just a simple mitered frame. Uh, I did make it a little more complex by adding some bevels to our pieces so that they kind of th it guides your eye towards that bookmatch panel, but I wanted it again to be as simple and beautiful as possible. Now once we actually glue up this frame, we're going to make it a little bit more complex overall and you guys are going to get to see some of this come together shortly here, but as you can see here, because we have that nice straight grain, your eye is mainly drawn to that beautiful bookmatch panel. And so for this next part, I wanted to add a little bit of strength to these miters. Within the woodworking world, there is quite a big debate about whether or not a miter is a strong joint, uh, and I generally don't refer to it or look at it as one of the stronger joints, so adding some little bit of reinforcement is just going to make it a little bit stronger. So I took this opportunity to add in a little bit of walnut here, just to create some visual contrast and just to do something that I thought would look kind of interesting. So using a dado stack, I just cut a simple cross grain or uh, 45 degree cut through the corners here and then glued in these walnut pieces. And so when I did this, I really had a hard time keeping my dado stack accurately placed to keep my pieces lined up here. So some of my diagonal pieces are not perfectly aligned with each other. And so when you would open the door, you could actually see that they weren't aligned, which we're going to fix that very interestingly in just a second here. But before I did that, I went through and cut out all my hinges, fit everything up, and started to get the door fitting in place. So again, this is a very simple process, surprisingly enough, fitting hinges onto a door is actually quite an easy task. So one of the things you have to be very careful of though, is that you need to pre-drill all your screw holes. This is one of those things that is an unarguable fact. But once I had everything mounted, I went and tried to fit up my door. So as you can see here, my door is just a little bit too wide, and this is where I made a massive mistake. I thought that I could take off just a little bit of material on my table saw, and that would help my door fit up. Little did I know, as you can see at the back of the cut here, we are taking off a lot more than I actually needed to. So what ended up happening is that my door was way too loose, we had an uneven gap all the way around, and it just looked horrible. So after a little bit of panicking here and there, I decided I came up with this beautiful, awesome idea, one of, you know, probably one of my favorite things that came out of this project, and that was to make these simple little thin 3 16 thick walnut pieces that I then glued around the whole outside of the door here. And so these again are mitered onto the sides, but I had to use my shooting board here because I wanted these to be absolutely precise. So unlike the miters that are making up the door themselves, uh, it's very hard to cut miters onto thin stock on a table saw. So by using my shooting board, it just made the whole process a little bit more accurate and honestly a lot easier. And so you can see that these pieces are just glued right to the outside edges. And what I really love about this is it adds a little bit of a shadow line to the outside of the door. So because you have, because we're combining that white oak and walnut, you get this little, little slightly darker wood on the outside edges. You can also see that it helps cover up that, those diagonal pieces and, the, and hides the fact that some of them are not perfectly aligned with each other. So this is just, you know, I could not have asked for a better design choice for this project 
And the funniest thing is that it all came because I just royally screwed up. I was being impatient on the table saw and I messed up my door in the first place. So again, some of the best things, some of the best design features you can get within fine woodworking all come because you make mistakes. And honestly, one of the best ways to learn fine woodworking is by screwing up on actual projects. Because again, on a project like this, with this book match panel in this door, I had no other choice. I, you know, I, I wasn't just going to throw away this beautiful panel that I had. So I had to figure out a solution. And again, this is just proof, you know, the proof is right in front of you that when you screw up on a real project, it forces your brain to actually work and to do something that is going to be a lot, you know, actually comes out a lot more interesting. So another trick that I did use once I actually replaced with or added in the walnut strips there was using my router to clear out the hinge mortise. And again, this turned out way better than trying to use my router plane. So definitely a little bit of, you know, a few little lessons learned here and there, but overall I am super thrilled with how this thing came together. And you can see now that the door actually fits in. And so one of the hardest things with a project like this is just understanding the order of operations. You want to make sure that the, you don't miss out or forget to do something uh, that you then can't go back and add later on. And so now we're going to start working on the, on the back panel, which is a, just three shiplap pieces that are just held in place with some pin nails. But the reason I decided to do the back panel after I did the door is that if the door got stuck in place while I was trying to fit it up, there would be no way to get it out easily if the back panel was installed in place. So I made sure to fit up the door and do all that sizing before I decided to put in the back panel. And then again, going back to the order of operations, I made sure to put in the back panel before I started fitting up the floating shelves that are going to go on the inside because I want to make sure that those shelves fit exactly up against that back panel. There's no questions of them not lining up properly. And so these shiplap back panels are just a really nice, simple way to have to allow for a little bit of wood movement in those panel pieces as well as to keep a nice, simple, strong back panel. And so this case is going to be hung on the wall using a French cleat system. Now, a French cleat is really the only way to hang up a cabinet like this. These things are super heavy, you know, whether you make it out of pine or white oak, uh, they do have a lot of mass to them and you need to make sure that they are structurally sound when you hang them on the wall because if something like this comes down on your floors, you are going to have a dent in your hardwood flooring that is going to, you're not going to be able to get it out because these are heavy pieces of furniture. And so moving on to the floating shelves, you can see here that we're just using again those nice wide pieces with a few pieces of walnut. And so what I wanted to do with these shelves is because I decided to use solid pieces, you know, these are solid nine inch wide pieces of white oak, I wanted to make sure that they weren't going to cup or do anything weird. So I decided to add in some breadboard ends and that's what we're going to be doing with those walnut pieces you've seen me cutting already. And so this is something that is kind of an interesting thought process in my mind where, you know, one, one option would definitely be to just throw those pieces of white oak in there. Uh, I could have cut, milled them, and just put them in place and just kind of waited to see what they would do. But I know for a fact that if I tried to do that, something would go wrong and I would have to probably go back and remake these shelves in the future when these solid pieces warped and cuffed and did all the things that the, that wood does. And so this is one of the most important things within fine woodworking is understanding wood movement and just generally how wood works. Uh, it's really what sets the difference between, you know, fine woodworking and kind of your general woodworkers is that fine woodworkers really want, to, you know, really have an understanding and have, con have a concept of how joinery and how wood moves and all this kind of stuff. So being able to do stuff like this is just really just kind of an exciting thing to do. And so this is really just a simple breadboard end, the exact same thing that I would do on my, like I did on my desk or any, on any other pieces of furniture I've built. So all we have is a middle dowel that is perfectly fitted in place and is holding this whole piece together basically. And then those outer two dowels are just kind of there to hold the walnut close to the white oak, but they do have some, some side to side movement so that that white oak panel can grow and expand freely. So again, this is where having something like a drum sander really came in handy because I wasn't able to get these everything perfectly together. Uh, when you're dealing with thin stock like this, things can just kind of cause problems. So the drum sander let me get these panels perfectly flat, then I could just go back in with my random orbit sander to clean them up. Then using my shooting board, I was able to get them perfectly fitted into the case here. So I wanted them to be perfectly flush up against the back panel there and then sliding right up against where the door is gonna sit. 
And so the last part of this project is to fit in the drawers. So the drawers, again, I wanted to try and get a little bit fancy with it. So for the drawer fronts, I'm gonna use a little bit of resawn eight quarter white oak so that I can hopefully get a little bit of a book match going across the front there. I also had this charcuterie board that I screwed up on a few months ago. Uh, I just had the, you know, some nice straight grain walnut and I decided to use that for my drawer sides because I could resaw it down and get the thickness that I needed. So when you're doing really small pieces, when you're working with really small pieces like this, this is where a shooting board is going to come in really handy because it lets you get, you know, perfectly squared up stock and it just makes life a little bit easier. Now, one thing I do want to mention about these drawers is that I went a little bit too heavy on my front pieces. Uh, I think they were, their final thickness was just under three quarters of an inch. And, you know, looking at them now, I do realize that they are <laughs> way, way too thick for what they needed to be. Uh, I only really needed maybe five eighths of an inch or half an inch for those, the, for those front pieces. But again, it's all something that it's, you know, it's a good learning opportunity, honestly. So they are a little bit heavier than I probably would do now. But again, yeah, they do look, they still look good. And so for the drawers, I went back to doing my one to eight ratio dovetails and just hand cutting them. Because as I mentioned in the video where I talked about the dovetail jigs, uh, when I'm doing stuff like drawers, I'm not super worried about having the most beautiful dovetail joinery ever that ever existed. Uh, I'm more worried about just kind of getting them done, making sure that they look pretty good, but I do want to kind of just get them done because there's a, they're quite a time consuming process. And if you really take the time to set up the jig, this is where it can kind of be disheartening to you know take your time setting up the jig and doing all that constantly. So I really like just being able to have the ability to hand cut these and just have, you know, be able to get a good result. And so realistically, the only reason I didn't use a jig in this instance is because I wanted specifically one to eight ratio dovetails because that looks better at the smaller size. And the only jig that I have is a 14 degree dovetail jig. So and if I did have a one to eight ratio jig, I may have used that in this situation. But again, it all comes up to personal preference and just kind of however you're feeling that day. Some days you want to use a jig because you want perfect dovetails. Other days, you just kind of want to go at it and get it done. But overall, I'm super happy with how these drawers came out. Again, they're super, you know, they were a nice small thing that came out absolutely beautifully. And one of the things that I really like about these drawers is the fact that I chose to use walnut for the inside drawer sides. Now, this is something that may be a little bit controversial in the woodworking community because generally you don't want to hide a wood like walnut. You're, you don't want to use a wood like walnut for drawer sides. It's just, it's kind of a waste in a lot of aspects. But I really like it that when you pull out the drawer, you just get this, you get this little bit of a surprise that there's this just really beautiful straight grain walnut hidden inside there. So it's just a really nice subtle touch that I think makes a huge difference to this piece overall. And so with these drawers, I was able to get a nice piston fit and which makes them, you know, bounce back and forth when you push them in. And then with the bottom panels here, again, I wanted to keep up using walnut just because it looks so good. So I fit up this very thin piece of walnut on the bottom here. And I wanted to make sure that any, or pretty much any time I do drawers in a fine piece like this, I always make sure that they are removable or replaceable. That way, if they ever crack or break, it's very easy to just slide the piece out and replace it. So it's a really important thing to do, you know, just to make sure that things last as long as possible and are constantly useful. So then I could go through and add finish over all of our final pieces. So the door again got a final coat of finish and this is where you can really start to see the beautiful contrast between that white oak and that walnut. And going through and adding finish to the drawers was just a lovely experience because bringing that, walnut, that straight grain walnut to life is just one of the best feelings in the world. And so one of the last important steps here is swapping out all of the silver steel screws that are, are holding my hinges in place for the actual color matched brass screws. So this is one of the things that I really love about Horton Brass's hardware is that they give you the steel screws so that when you're building and constantly taking the screws in and out, you can have these, st these stronger steel screws. And then for your final installation, you can then put in these perfectly color matched brass screws to bring everything you know, beautifully together.